Well, my dad's a very great guy. He goes out to different countries. He was helping during the, the war, supporting the people and the troops there, delivering supplies. Uh, I missed him a lot, but I knew that it's what he had to do, and I really hoped that he was safe there. So I went uh, in the second week of the war. Um, so we were doing uh, rescue operations at the border. And then uh, early March was my first delivery inside Ukraine. And then late March, uh, while the Battle of Kiev was still on, I went in Kiev, which was a, a military camp. One thing that very much struck me is, and I wish I had stopped and taken a picture of it, but we were outside of uh, Gostomo, where there was quite heavy fighting. And this was a couple of weeks after the Russians had left, maybe even a week after the Russians had left. And there was a guy repainting the sign of Gostomo in Ukrainian colors. And I just, that was one thing that really struck me. The most difficult is the people there, the children, the very, very young children still living in those destroyed cities, uh, lining up with their parents for food or water, and to see them still happy somehow, you know, in the times of war, in the middle of a completely bombed out city, still trying to live a childhood, have fun, you know. They don't see it the way it is, you know, war. The majority of humanitarian assistance is still being delivered by Ukrainian organizations. It's Ukrainians who are helping Ukrainians. It's Ukrainians that are raising money and delivering to Ukrainians. Humanitarian organizations, international organizations, have been collecting billions of dollars and sitting on it. There was no international organizations on the Ukrainian side of the border for three or four months after the conflict started. You would only see Caritas, World Central Kitchen, a couple of, so a couple of faith-based and other NGOs who were there, and that was it. I remember the first day that I saw a UN vehicle drive by, I started cheering because it was the first time after them collecting billions. My now good friend, of course, Lex, and Lex's story. So when Lex got out of Chernigov and he got back, I said, don't go anywhere until I get there and I give you a set of body armor. Do not leave, do not go anywhere. And what does he do? He sleeps one night, gets up, and then goes back out to uh, Donbass. On the second day, second or third day after war, I uh, realized that here, whatever needs to be done can be done from here, from my house. So I uh, decided to head, head over and see if I could be useful there somehow. I uh, seen on the news that there was a bus coming with orphans, somewhere from the eastern regions. Uh, on the way there, we ran into a volunteer vehicle that just brought some kids. Uh, so I went up to the driver and asked, you know, if, if there's anything I can do to help. And he asked me if I would be willing to evacuate people f from the areas where the fighting was taking place. I said yes, and they said, well, if you're ready, you're making a trip. Yes, you get scared for so long. After constant shelling for a few days, you get used to it. And then, you know, instead of being scared, you just get really, really angry. You can always have hope in humanity, seeing all these, even though there's horrible things going on in the world, there's always going to be people better than that. There's always going to be some way, much more outweighed people of really supporting humanity, you know? A lot of good people, great people, even in times of the worst, they put themselves last, they help others. And it, it really, you know, has a great effect on me that there's some people that can just do great things, even if it means risking themselves, still they continue doing it.